Hi folks, bit of a different show for you today. I'm here in Houston, Texas. I'm actually visiting Jason Brashears from Archaics. And we've been uh, checking things out and discussing a few things about history and very interesting sort of a character. So I thought while I was here, rather than bring you one of the normal shows that I've been doing lately, which has been mainly gathering news and letting you know what's going on with the smart grid and the whole COVID scam and all that sort of stuff, I thought I'd go back onto ancient history a little bit, just for at least one show, just to sort of bring you some information that uh, I think is pretty amazing. I was here for a few days. We come did a bit of a conference. It was uh, live streamed. I think you'll probably find it on, on YouTube. I'll put a link to it below if you want to go and check it out. It's about seven and a half hours, I think. And the audio is not that good, but there was some information that was covered in that little conference and that little presentation, which is quite an incredible discovery. And I want to talk to you about all of that now with Jason. So we're just going to go into the house here. Pretty amazing stuff, folks, like, um, and, and something that is, is so amazing, but so obvious at the same time, once you see it, it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't really unsee it. But yeah, di different sort of a show for you folks. I just thought it was time to get onto another topic for a little while. This is Jason's place, nice little place he's got here. Staying with a lovely lady here as well. She's not here at the moment, but that's the way it is and it's a it's a good place it's a very comfy little place so this is where I've been staying which has been pretty cool but what Jason also Martin Leakey was here from Flat Earth British he was staying here for a few days as well so he was there for the conference and it was a discovery that was sort of basically made by Martin and Jason when they were looking at the Great Wall of China and what's really going on with the Great Wall of China and uh, I'm just going to Jason's office here. There he is. He's the man himself. Hey. And uh, we're going to discuss a few things about the, uh, the Great Wall of China. And a little bit of a perspective that maybe people haven't seen before. Check out this book collection, folks. It's not bad, eh? This is just the small one, isn't it? You've got another bigger one at your other place. Yes, i got another one on my other studio. Yeah. All right, so yeah, we're going to talk about the Great Wall of China and we're going to show you some stuff that, uh, like I said, it's pretty amazing and it's pretty obvious. Once you see it, you sort of can't unsee it and it's amazing that no one has sort of noticed all of this sort of stuff before. But uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So what do you reckon, Jason? I think we're ready to do this. <laughs> So here with Jason Brasier is discussing the myths around the construction of the Great Wall of China. And this is an interesting looking book that you've got here, Jason. Tell us about this book. Well, uh, I just wanted to show you that the narrative for the Great Wall of China was already well set over a century ago. They had already determined that they were going to tell us that a 5,000 mile long construction, 40 foot high, sometimes 20 foot high, with 25,000 castles called towers, 
was built in a 10 year period by a Chinese emperor who happened to also burn all the records and historical libraries, all the books, scrolls, and kill the scribes. Uh, he basically erased his entire history. This is the narrative. That one's dead. <laughs> It's it's kind of ludicrous when you think about it. Like you build this, it's, and it's essentially a five thousand mile long castle. Yes, it is. With with with, with towers, guard towers, which are function as all sorts of things. I mean, not just just guard towers. Like these are, are multi story. They've got basement sections. They've got high sections. They've got storerooms. They've got they've got rooms. They've probably got accommodation. Um, right. There's so many things about the wall. That, I mean, we've often looked at it and said, well, this obviously isn't what they're telling us, but what exactly is it, you know? And we're told that it was a wall that was built for defence. So even when people have been looking at it, they've been going, well, even if it wasn't built by the Chinese and it was probably built by the Tartarians as a Tartarian defence wall or by the Mongols or whatever, but uh, there's no record of it ever actually being used in any battles at all, is there? Absolutely not. And we can even start with these maps to get a real good understanding of what's going on here. Yeah. Because you're right. People have thrown Tartarians in. They've thrown they've thrown different civilizations, Roman, I mean the excuse me, the Chinese. It's a it actually puts itself together when we start analyzing all the independent facts. Because the establishment has basically hidden what this thing is. However, all the clues to what it really is in its true function are easily found. Yeah, it's, it's like I said before, it's something that's so obvious that it's amazing no one's seen it before. And this is the result of just uh, Jason and Martin sitting here one day, just throwing stuff around about what's going on with this wall. You know? And then Jason started asking questions about measurements and things. And so we're gonna get into some of that now. So what's the basics? And, and interesting as well, when you look at the, the maps, of course, of, uh, of certain things that happened in the area. You want to go through this? Yeah, what you're seeing on the screen is the official why was the Great Wall of China built. This is the official deal. It's to resist Mongolian invasions. It's to, re it's to resist. Now, you have to understand, here are the, here's the Celestial Empire. Here, here's the Chinese with their vast armies and all that, and they have to build this super construction to keep out some goat herders. It doesn't even make sense. What really doesn't make sense is, like Max said, there's no incidents in the recorded in the recorded historical record where the Chinese ever had to even use the wall to defend themselves from the Mongols. Yeah, and that's that's profound. And if they did use the wall to defend themselves against the Mongols, well, why was it built the way it was built? There's so much to this, so let's go through it. Let's have a look at this map of where the wall is, and what's another map that you've got there? So we got over? we got a few maps to look at. These are provided by Martin Leakey. Here's an, here's an old map right here that it, uh, it basically shows the Great Wall. You have to blow it up. I can't do that right here. But this is an old map showing that the Great Wall is basically the Silk Road yeah. that, that was known in ancient times that, that trafficked India, Central Asia, the Middle East. Even as far as Greece, items from the Silk Road have been found in Greek tombs. Uh, all, all throughout Egypt, Silk Road items that have been traded and trafficked. And it shows the Silk Road maps are very clear. It's very clear. Even the oldest maps show these trade routes. But we're going to have to discuss something real quick. Because the Great Wall of China is supposed to be in China, right? Do you see this right here, Max? This yeah. old map? Yeah, this is incredible. This is the... the well, it looks exactly like the Great Wall. I mean, it is the Great Wall. It is the Great Wall. It's yeah. another piece of the Great Wall. But yeah. where is it at? I'm going to blow it up for you, Max. Yeah, it's in the Caucasus. Central so, Eurasia. It's in the Caucasus Mountains, identical to the Great Wall of China in the Caucasus Mountains. So this is an anomaly we're not going to discuss in this video, but we have to show that maybe this wasn't Chinese after all. Well, that's the thing, it wasn't, and this is what happened when they were just discussing this, like just throwing measurements and things around and looking at, you know, how Chinese architecture is constructed, how Chinese bridges are constructed. Um, Chinese have a particular way of building things. Yes, they and, do. And the stuff that people are attributing to Tartaria or whatever, what they're calling Greco, Greco Roman style, this is a particular type of architecture. And when you look through the Grey Wall of China, 
it's all Greek or Roman style. And there's other giveaway signs as well. Like oh, the, oh, there's, there's, this is going to blow your mind. First of all, this is not a map of the Great Wall. What is this a map of? Mm. The uh, Silk Road. This is the ancient, legendary Silk Road. The fact that the Silk Road map app is is actually showing something else. You see where it ends right here in Beijing, where it goes over here, mm -hmm. where there's a major stop here in Shanghai? Yeah. You see this route of the Silk Road? Let's go back and look at this map Yeah. of the Great Wall. Yeah. The Great Wall and the Silk Road overlap, but they don't show them in the same map together. But they overlap. But the actual crux of the issue is where the Great Wall ends. Yeah, it's a dock. It's a dock. I mean, that's a dock, folks. Yes, it is. You can imagine at one time it had like wooden piers that went out. Yeah, And yeah. ships docked on it. It probably went out a good distance. Absolutely. But just like any quay or wharf, it's going to have to be founded in stone at the end. But the rest of it would have been wood. And thousands of years ago, it's gone. It's gone. And go back to that, that previous shot before as well. That down here, you look where the, the uh, road's going, you know. Oh, yeah. No, the other one, like the Caucasus. Oh, yeah, the Caucasus map right here. No, but it shows you, you go back to that other map of the uh, of the Silk Road. Silk Road map. Like yeah. this one, right? You've got all this here. If the Silk Road is actually the Great Wall of China, it would explain why those constructions are there. Well, it's there. Do you see where, you see where the Silk Road ends in the, right off of Shanghai? Mm. Do you see where that red tail goes to the ocean mm -hmm. right there? Hmm. Okay, that yeah. is this picture here. Yeah. yeah, that is with the wall. That's the that's outside of Shanghai. That is where it goes straight into the water. This is the Yellow Sea. Hmm. This would have given access to all merchant guilds, shipping guilds, all, all on on the Japanese, uh, Chinese coast, all of Indonesia, even as far as Australia. All the shipping in that area of the world could have come into that bay right there and unloaded their goods and sent them up the Silk Road. Absolutely, they could have received goods as well. And also, when you look at the one, there's so much stuff to um, confirm that this is what was going on. What really uh, made you sort of look at this was the measurements and the... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's a... It's a the, the, it defies... The, the imagination that the official narrative was that this was a defensive wall against the Mongols because defensive architecture in the ancient world would reflect that if that was true, but that's not what we find here. Let's look at this picture here. This picture here, do you see the double crenellations on the wall back here? Yeah. You yeah. see where they were removed right here in the forefront? The yeah. double crenellations are removed in the forefront, but they continue here, and they're on the and they're and they're in between this tower. And they go all the way up the mountain. It's double crenellations. These are battlements put on both sides. If you're building a super construction to 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 repel an invasion, you would never, as a military engineer, give your enemy a defensible position if he takes your construction. Right? Exactly. You would never do that. But this is exactly what we see. Crenellations, battlements on both sides of an elevated road. Hmm. This thing's 20, at the lowest point, the Great, the great Wall of China is 20 feet off the ground, which is still high. But in the average is 27 feet across 5,000 miles of construction. But it gets as high as 40 feet. Something else was do, was going on here. This was not to repel invasion because walls to repel invasion would not be hollow. Did you know that there's chambers and tunnels underneath underneath these roads? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's it's like a castle that's five thousand miles long, and all of the the roads and like the the width of the roads. Like you look at the the width of Roman roads. Look at this right here's a good perfect picture. Here's a perfect picture right here, guys. When Martin and I were looking at this. We had to go into the measurements, and we, we found something profound. The width of the Great Wall of China, depending upon the topography and what it had to narrow, narrow ravines it went through and all that, it is 13 to 16 feet in width, which is not a uniform unit of Chinese measurement for their own roads, but it is for Rome. Rome had standardized uh, many things, such as bridge building, aqueducts, canal works, 
of building foundations and roads are all standardized throughout the entire Roman provincial territories and Roman Empire. And what we find here is that the Great Wall of China is the exact width of a Roman road. Now, this is double double crenellations again you see here. Mm -hmm. And again, going through a forest wall. Look at the battlements. Mm. Look at the battlements. Yeah, made to defend yourself from marauders on each side of the road. On each China. side. They, they must have had to defend, whoever was using the road had to defend against the Chinese yeah. and the Mongols. Yeah, exactly. And you've got, you got 25,000 of these towers along the way, and they're all at, at divisions uh, placement. They're all, all equally placed. Yep. And again, it's a Roman measurement. Absolutely. The distance between these 25,000 towers is uniform. It all depends on the geography. Sometimes they're a few feet off because of where they had to build. But the mean distance between 25,000 is five, between 25,000 constructions that we call towers, on the, which are actually miniature castles, it is 5,430 feet. And it's no coincidence, guys. That is not a Chinese unit of measurement, but it is Roman. It's called 5,000 peds. It's exactly where you peed, where you get pedestrian, like Walker, where you where you get pedestal. Uh, but peds, 5,000 peds, 5,000 Roman feet is a mile. That's the distance between these constructions. And 5,000 peds is 5,430 standard British feet that we, that we use today. And that's not a coincidence. Look at this, more. Look at that beautiful picture. They're defending on both sides. Mm. Yeah, it's a trade route. It's look at this old illustration. Mm. Same thing. Look at look at the battlements. Mm. The reason I'm being so detail specific with you is because there are tourists today. Like I got emails after the first presentation of tourists to say, "Hey, Jason, you're really onto something. Let me tell you what they're doing." The areas that have the double battlements are not the tourist sites. Mm. They take you to areas where one side's been 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 a. Uh, uh, sheared down. They've taken the masonry out mm. and you're not allowed to, to, to travel the whole Great Wall. They have tourist areas where you're allowed to go to and they're very carefully doctored. They even put Chinese pagodas on top of the, on top of some of the towers. Yeah. They did that. Yeah, it's crazy. But these old illustrations, they tell a story. Look at that. That's yeah. the that's the Great Wall as it was found like 200 years ago. And it's got battlements on both sides which it's not supposed to have. If it was built to defend against nomads, goat herders, invasion from Mongols, then it would only have crenellations on one side. Mm. So if the wall got overran, the construction could not be used as a defense against the ones that lost it. Mm. So that's crazy. It's yeah. And there's also, yeah, it's everywhere. And the bridges and aqueducts as well. When it, when it uh, crosses rivers, you look at the, the type of bridges and the type of archways it's using as it crosses these rivers. Uh, yes, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but real quick, before we go into the, that type of architecture, I want you to notice something. Do you see anything unusual about this gate? Because I'm going to blow it up for you. Do you see the different building Method, yeah. Different building methods and different two, constructions. Two different construction, two different construction periods. So how was it built by one guy over ten years? It was not. It wasn't. This was a much older structure before the Chinese added to it, or someone else did. But what you're looking at, see the size of that guy, and he's even closer than the wall behind him. What you're looking at is cut and dressed heliolithic blocks. This is standard for the. 18th to 15th century BC. This is the standard building materials they built with gigantic blocks. And this original construction is still partly here, but those are granite blocks. The rest of the wall is kiln fired clay brick. All this. And it was built by, and it was all this is an added construction. And we're going to go into that because the Chinese aren't the one that added all this to a much more ancient construction. Somebody had already built a road here in very ancient times. And then somebody else came and the Chinese got the credit for it. And they do partially get the credit. And we'll explain why the Chinese did build the wall 
but they didn't design it. Someone else did. But yes, this is a two different. This is two different types of construction, and you see that all throughout. Everywhere where the Great Wall stops, you see this megalithic architecture, gigantic blocks that are employed. It's it's an older civilization. Mm -hmm. It's not 220 BC that when the Chinese were said to have built this, and and 130. Uh, excuse me, 200 BC, when it is said that the Chinese made first contact with Rome. So this is in the official narrative. First contact between East and West was 200 BC. So it fits the narrative, though, that the Great Wall was built in 220 BC. But the narrative is giving the credit for somebody for for where it's not due. Yeah. So and it's interesting, like looking, even looking at pictures like this, like that's obviously a much much older civilization. Mm -hmm. They've simply built a pagoda on top. They put a Chinese pagoda on it. And, yeah. And the, and the Chinese build a lot of stuff with wood and paper and stuff like that. They don't build megalithic stone stuff like this. And it's like you say, it's like we've got cultures that are layered and pancaked on top of each other, going back millennia. It, yes. It, it's remarkable. Yes. Just you, how much is buried. You can imagine the superstructure that was on top of this at one oh, time. Yeah. At one time. Oh, yeah. But you know, earthquakes, disasters, uh, invasion, and the Chinese, the Chinese have this genetic, it's like a synaptic failsafe. It seems that when their civilization is blooming and burgeoning and everything's going right, all of a sudden they get an emperor who just erases their history, destroys all their books, kills all their priests, all their scribes, and it sends them into some cultural reset for centuries. The Chinese have done this over and over and over. And different Chinese people have exhibited a, a genius like Confucius, but the rest of the Chinese culture never seems to take it on. And the genius just lives for a while or is regarded as an anomaly and Chinese culture maintains. It's some genetic failsafe that, that basically retards development. The Chinese always ascend and then they tear themselves down. This is, this is something I've noticed in my own studies over and over. But here is another, here is another gate and it shows you the different levels of construction. See where all the, all the, all the older blocks, mm -hmm. these are older blocks, just, just, just different periods of construction. Even the battlements were done in red yeah. brick. Yeah. Now, we're, now, I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of the Tartaria research. Martin Leakey has this old world structures around the world that have been rebuilt. They've been rebuilt with this odd red brick on all the continents. It's the same. And, and what's crazy is no one knows where they're getting this red material to make this red brick red brick there's been theories listen this is this might be gross but there's theories that it's genocides and there's blood and there's blood in the mixed in the clay there's also there's also the phoenix phenomenon uh hypothesis where every 138 years as i have documented throughout five, 58 centuries we have these massive storms of red dust red mud and red rain according to the low according to the relative humidity and whatever ge geography it's happening but uh, yeah, we have red brick all over. Even even in even here in Texas, we have old buildings that were rebuilt with red brick. Hmm. Maybe they get it from Australia. You want to see the sand in Australia? It's so red in the in, in the desert. I often speculated, and other people have speculated, oh, yeah. where it comes from, why there's so much iron in the sand. So these are these are just uh, old pictures of the Great Wall before before the Chinese came and doctored it up and put pagodas on them and all that. And, I mean, you can see that it's, it's Roman. It's so Roman when you oh, look yeah. at it. And oh, it's yeah. so obviously a trade route when you really look at it. That's what it is. I think, what would it, what would it be for? It is and an like elevated you say, there's, road. There's no record of any, any war being fought or, or defended against. And if you were building it for defensive purpose, why would you have all these, these chambers below the wall? Why would the wall be hollow? And there are entrances from both sides as well. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's all, what, 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 we're, what we're presenting here is that this is not the Great Wall of China. It's actually what? It's the Great Silk Road of Rome. That's what it is. And what you're yeah. looking at in this... Even if, China, even if China was in... Perhaps there was a, a great trade empire that happened between Rome and China. I mean, obviously there was. There was mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going between them. Yes, there was. Whoever was ultimately responsible, it's, it's definitely Roman design. And there's no way that it was built as a defensive wall to keep Mongos out. There's even air, there's pictures you've got, I'm sure we'll get to later, that show areas of the wall where there's like like exits oh, down yeah. to what oh, where yeah. used to be cities or villages. Oh yeah, there's communities there. Some were some were there to provide maybe these five towers here, which are all a mile apart, water. 
Other ones provide food. Other ones provide <laughs> livestock. I mean, we're, we're talking about the Amazon of the ancient world. And we're going to get to that. But we're talking about the Great Wall wasn't so just some guys carrying merchandise from Rome to China and from China to Rome and to Silk no, Road no, and no, India. No. We're talking about a full-fledged operation of the moving of merchandise that is already packaged up and it is sent down the wall to the empires and countries that, it's, that, that are to receive it. And it's no different than modern history in the 1800s. It's, it's, like a, it's like a department store franchise, the whole thing. Like you think about it, you've got these towers, the towers are full of goods, stocked with whatever the, the local town uses the most is all stocked there in the tower. And this is a continuous flow from both directions, regulated by a Roman mile between each one. So perhaps you'd go even five towers per day. You'd have hotel sections in there where you can stay because you wouldn't be staying on the wall. That's right. You, That's you'd right. have accommodation, you'd have brothels, you'd have storehouses, you'd have everything all along the wall. And they'd be supplying them, constantly supplying these different towers. So if you wanted something from, from one end of the wall, you wouldn't have to wait for it to travel 5,000 miles. It's already been in route. It's already there, it's already in route because we know what you need. And even with these, these, like you say, these ramps that are going off that are like exits to other, other towns, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trade route. It's obviously so, a trade route. Well, I'm going to show pictures. I'm going to show pictures of what he just described. But this right here, these are Roman arches. These are inside the constructions, the towers. And what's really interesting is the towers themselves are not uniform. They, they have like five basic patterns. Some of them look like they're designed to house people, people just hotels. Some of them merchandise. Some of them look like they may have been food courts where locals could come in and sell their fruit and their, their vegetables and all that. Some of them definitely look like garrisons, but they're far and few between. So, so these are Roman arches. These are Roman arches. Look how much open space is in here. Yeah. 70, 80 people could come in here and deal because I'm going to tell you now, if we're right and merchandise was being moved thousands of miles rapidly toward Rome, then not only Rome, but for distribution throughout the Near East and the Middle East, then I promise you, at nighttime when the sun went down, they locked that road down or they wouldn't have battlements on both sides. They didn't fear armies. They feared pirates, marauders, bandits. Yeah, they, exactly. thought they feared thieves yeah. and they had a good reason to fear it. That's why they had the battlements on both sides. But they would lock down every night. Everybody would be in their respective towers. The road would be probably patrolled, one or two soldiers per mile. It would be very efficient, but they had to do this. It was worth it to Rome to do the Silk Road as a fortification because we have done the research and the exchange of goods is fantastic. Do you have that list of the exchange of goods of what Rome was receiving from China? Uh, somewhere. I'd have to I'd have to find it. Where are we? Let's see. It's a there's a list in here somewhere. Yeah, it's a lot. We got a lot of data here, guys, on this, but it's a. But the past is a predicate for the future in, in the collective, guys. Let me explain. In the 1800s, the exact same scenario unfolded. American engineers designed a transport system. You guys know of it as Union Pacific. You know of it as the railway system and all that. But who built it? Who built the American railway system? Yeah. It was designed by Americans. But Americans didn't build it. Who did? Yeah, the Chinese. The, the Irish, Chinese. Whatever. They called them coolies. The Chinese built it. It's the same scenario. Roman engineers went in, and when they took over the Silk Road, when Rome finally took the Silk Road, they went in and fortified it, and they used the Chinese to do it. And they used Chinese laborers, probably donated from the, the uh, Chinese emperor, because he saw... Because we found out, doing a simple Google, Google search, we found out that at... 2,000 years ago, especially during the reign of like Marcus Aurelius, hundreds of tons of gold was being sent from Rome to China. There's no other way to send that but up, the, up this, mm. this, this route here. Which could explain why it was so well fortified. I mean, they, they got a lot of silk back from China as well. But it, it just makes perfect sense. At this they got jade, ivory, silk, spices. 
Maybe or, it wasn't originally like a, a route that was used by uh, camel trailers or whatever, but I mean, I don't know. There's places there that you probably wouldn't travel. Yeah, I'm I mean, it goes over all, all types of terrain as well. Well, the Chinese are known for not only the rickshaw, which is a small, narrow cart that can hold see a lot of weight. Pagoda on top. Yeah, but see the rib. See, you see the brick. How yeah, the brick yeah, is very yeah. different than the yeah, rest. Yeah, yeah, they've added. It's that. obviously, obviously added. Yeah. So the uh, the Chinese though have perfected the backpack. Have you ever seen the Chinese with these giant backpacks that go two and three feet above their heads, yeah. and they got it all perfectly balanced, and it's got even got shoulder supports. The Chinese have learned to carry a lot of weight per man. And you can imagine if each team of merchandisers is, you have Chinese coolies that are, each one of them's got a backpack and a forward pack. They don't have to carry their own food and water. It's all provided on the way. Yeah. Every bit of it, there's all, you don't, travelers and merchants didn't have to carry it because the wall is about tr rapid transport. And that's what was going on. And you might have 50 Chinese in a train they're all assigned to the same group. They got one team leader, and, and they're assigned and they're assigned ten towers a day. That's ten miles a day. They're moving merchandise. But if you've got five hundred of these these little fifty man teams steadily moving merchandise, then that means that a courtesan a courtesan in Rome can order something in the very next day get it from a Roman warehouse. Mm, exactly. Just because like that. On the next tower, you've got the same thing. The, the goods are being constantly moved down the wall. So it's, it's yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. Here's some old, old here's an old illustration of, of part of the Great Wall. Now, if you notice, what do you notice about the Chinese construction in this one image? Yeah, exactly. What do you notice? like the wall. They're not even a part of the wall. Look, they're further back. Yeah. But look at look at the wall. That's not Chinese. No. Here's a very old illustration of the wall, and it shows the wall separate from Chinese constructions. Yeah. It's just a really, really good picture. Again, very old picture of the wall. Another old picture of the wall. Correlations are gone yeah. on one side. Exactly. Okay. Here's what you were talking about, Roman aqueducts and bridges. Yeah. These are Roman arches. These are these are not Chinese constructions. No. Definitely not. The, Chi the Romans built for utility. Ut they were utilitarians. Unless it's in Rome or somewhere imperial palace where aesthetics were, were wanted. When it was strictly utility and they didn't care about anything else, the Romans were very austere. Their constructions were built to last and they were, and they were built just for that function with no artwork whatsoever. Yeah. Chinese are not like that. I'm going to show pictures of what Chinese bridges look like. This is, this is part of the Great Wall too. That's yeah. all part of the Great Wall. Yeah, it's Roman aqueducts. Roman, Roman aqueduct. It looks identical to aqueducts all throughout Europe. Exactly. So here we go to Great Wall of China. Here it is again, over another river. Now, I'm going to blow your mind. Max, look at this Chinese bridge. Yeah, exactly. Nothing like what you would see. And they built all their bridges like different depending on where they were and they put a lot of aesthetics into it. Yeah, of course, the, the, their culture shines through artistically in their architecture. But there's another clue here, because I'm going to show you another bridge. Look at this bridge. Mm. Chinese boat, Chinese bridge. I'm going to see if you, see if you notice what I'm talking about. This bridge compared to the other bridge, now compared to this third Chinese bridge. Mm. Now we're going to look at a fourth Chinese bridge. What do you notice about all four bridges? Well, they're all different, and they're all like... They, Chinese right? do not have uniform, like exactly. the Romans did. Exactly. They do not have a uniform engineering science for bridge yeah. building. They're built aesthetically depending on their surroundings, what's going to fit in aesthetically. Which is what? Ah. Feng Shui. Feng Shui, yeah. Exactly. The Chinese build according to the topography. The Great Wall didn't give a damn about the, that austere construction. Went through everything. It was very unbeautiful. It was something the Chinese would never do. The Chinese built their constructions to blend into the environment. It's called feng shui. It's what they would have done. The Great Wall is an eyesore. The way it just zigzags and goes <laughs> up and down. It's just an eyesore. And it's uniform the whole way. Uniform, uniform battlements, uniform size, uniform tower placement, uniform towers. 
Yep. They're from the outside. So let's look. It's very at functional. This, look at this picture here. This is Chinese architecture. This is Chinese art. This is this is architectural aesthetics. Yeah. Nothing like there's nothing like that on the Great Wall. Nothing. Again, Roman arches. This is just a tower, one of the towers. Look how many people could be in, in, in these. And it's multiple levels and it goes underground. Yeah. And they have and they have roofs. I mean, a fifty man team could easily with the with all their packs could easily sleep in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think well, you could have had bunks, you could have had all sorts of stuff. You could have had little hotel sections. The fact that I mean, you mentioned hotels is, is is amazing. He's in sync not only with me but with the presentation because he has no idea what I'm about to show. But this is a modern day hotel in China, but it's a tower in the Great Wall. Well, there you go. Right there. there this go. is the Great Wall of China turned into a hotel. Right here. Look at that. Yeah. You have to pay a hotel to go to these luxury like rooms that are built out of the towers of the Great of the Great Wall of China. It's amazing. Look at this. Yeah. So remember, guys, it's a fundamental tenet. Now I know this is Crow House production here on this channel, but on our KX channel, it's a fundamental tenet. If anything can be shown to be true somewhere, it's probably true elsewhere as well. And this is what we're finding. If they're showing hotels right now in the Great well, then it's probably a direct reflection of ancient times when they were used to house people as well. Exactly. And it was a good guy. Roman arches all through there. You know? Yeah, it's Roman arches everywhere. Now, this is a guy on a bicycle because it, it conveys the idea of this is a conveyance, not a wall. Hmm. This is a conveyance. This was for travel not for defense, not, not for defense against armies. It was for safe travel and defense against small groups who thought they could, they could, they could take some Roman gold or Roman, or Roman uh, merchandise. Yeah. So, here it is again. Look at the beautiful Roman architecture. Hmm. This is all inside the towers. And you could have, you could have um, tables of vendors in there or you could turn that into a hotel yeah, for yeah. the night. You could have... Have minstrels. Yeah, and it's it's, it's multiple there. floors though. But you're right. Outside, these little small access doors are at the bottom of the towers. Sometimes they're on one side. Sometimes they're on both sides. But the beauty of it is, is a community of vendors yeah. from local villages could sell their stuff to people moving back and forth yeah. because they did not need food and water. Yeah, you can easily stop along the way on the wall, go down here and get some lunch from a vendor or whatever. Yeah. Oh, every bit of this would have been, a, this is the Amazon of the ancient world. Yeah. And it would have been it's just like as efficient a, as today. Like an Amazon slash shopping mall that goes for 5,000 miles. Absolutely, absolutely. Shopping mall slash hotel complex. So there's some, there. okay, before we move on forward, I, I want to address one thing. The Romans, the Romans if the Romans built the Great Wall of China, it is not outside their area of expertise because anybody, anybody who even knows a modicum of history knows that the Romans built a gigantic wall with battlements only on one side, way away from Rome in Britain. It's called Hadrian's Wall, and they don't have battlements on both sides, only on the side of the enemy. Because the Romans spread their empire all the way to the to the north of England when they came up with some severe resistance. Want we'll to tell them about that? Yeah, the Picts. The Picts. They, they just met the Picts in Scotland and just went. We're not even going to mess with these guys. So they just built a wall from one coast to the other to just keep them back. And yeah, the Picts, the giant Scots with their with their red hair and, and their blue paint and. That's right. Fighting butt naked like you were saying. Hell yeah! I mean, imagine you're Roman. You're a Ro you're a Roman soldier. <laughs> Your average height is five foot two. The Romans were a small people, but they had mastered the Greek phalanx and turned it into the the Roman legion. And they're they weren't they didn't fear anybody. They had the they had superior technology in armor and weapons. But they were a very small people. But you can imagine, like he said, you're dealing with six foot. Five butt naked guys who have painted their skin blue and got yellow war paint on, and were using giant battle axes and war axes and spears, and their hair's all wild, and they sing while they fight, called the Picts. They said, "You know what? We're not going to fight these fuckers. We're going to build a wall." So they built a wall. It's called Hadrian's Wall, 
And the reason I'm mentioning Hadrian's Wall, because if anything's true somewhere, it's probably true somewhere else. If the Romans could build a wall hundreds of miles long in Britain, and at great height in some places, and you can walk on it, the Romans, you can walk on top of the, all the way down the length of Hadrian's Wall. But the significant difference... Battlements on one side. The battlements only face the enemy. So... I just wanted to mention that before we go into this. I, th I think it's interesting too, looking at the pics and the red hair and the, the whole thing when we, we start looking at history and the like, the fact that they found so many red haired oh, yeah. people. Oh like yeah, open up a can of worms with that one. <laughs> Chinese tackling back in desert, Chinese archeologists actually found Caucasian red haired, red bearded mummies under the sand. This is what I don't tell you about the Chinese pyramids and stuff because when they start looking right. at all the Chinese pyramids they, they weren't built by the Chinese. All related to these really tall red-headed people. The same that have been reported to be found in the in uh, tombs in the Grand Canyon. Inca mummies. Inca mummies. The, Inca, like the South Inca aristocracy was all red-headed. All over the place. Like if there was uh, an ancient culture that existed which I'm pretty sure there was and a lot of us are sure there was that a lot of people euphemistically refer to as Tartaria which is simply a body of land that was once in Europe. But mm -hmm. there's similar architecture that exists all over the earth, which indicates that there was a similar culture that existed all over the earth. And whatever that was, it's, there's definitely some connection with these very tall, red-headed people who seem to be found wherever these pyramids and architecture is found. It's very interesting. And then you look at the pics, you know, Hadrian's Wall, just keep them back. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, man. The no, is. There very well could be. I mean, I don't believe in coincidences. But uh, I want to show this picture. This is ancient Baalbek, and it's and it's important to understand. Like I said, if something is true somewhere, it's probably true elsewhere as well. This is Baalbek, and what's fascinating about it is the Romans built temples on top of Baalbek, but Baalbek is a much older construction. This is interesting because Belbe, these are Roman temples on top of a much more ancient heliolithic, giant megalithic blocks. So big, and remember, the dating for that is 18th to 15th century BC for heliolithic architecture. Now, this is all Roman constructions on top of Belbeck, but that's the original Trilithon. Mm. Do you see the difference in the blocks? Oh yeah. The absolutely. Romans didn't build that, nor did they claim to. They built they claimed to have built over the top. Mm, exactly. And they built temples on it. These are the biggest cut stones ever found in existence at Trilithon. These these they can't they only estimate the, the weight around about hundred tons or something. It's crazy. But they like then they put twenty six feet high in a wall. And there's still one of them called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, which is found in a quarry. It's still in the quarry. It's, it's, it's miles lying. away. And it's there's, lying there's no trace of any road that they would have used to transport these things there. The, the, the most amazing uh, stone blocks in the world. We have, we have Roman pillars here at Belbeck. Just hmm. just showing you. Here, oh, there's, there's a... Yeah, there's, there's a guy, that's a guy standing there at the end of the wall there. Oh, yeah, I didn't even see him. That's a, that's a man standing there. These, feet are <laughs> these are 26 feet high in the wall, these yeah. stones. And there's three of them put together. It's amazing. It's absolutely incredible. It's amazing. So this is all art, Roman artwork at Petra. This is Petra now. The reason we're mentioning Petra, Petra is, is in Jordan. It is a 5,000-year-old underground series of facilities. It's what it was. It was used for storage, grain storage. It protects against the weather. It held humidity. Thousands of people live in Petra for thousands of years. The Romans took it over, and it's a part of the Silk Road. But all the architecture on the outside of this underground facility is Roman. The reason this is mentioned about Belbeck and Petra, that cat, the reason it's mentioned about, uh, uh, about these places is because this is what the Romans did. Mm -hmm. It's no different than the great, the great road of Rome that was, that's in China. Just because it's geographically located in China does not mean that it's Chinese. It means that the Romans went in there and built over a much older construction. Was that older construction of Heliolithic nature Chinese? It may have been, I don't know. But this presentation is about what Rome did. Mm. And this is definitely a road. And, and look at it, it's obviously a road. It's obviously a road. It's 100% a 100 road. 100%. Now, I'm showing this image right here. It's from, a, it's from a Disney movie. 
I'm showing this image here because this is a part of the collective establishment programming. There are subliminal messages in here that are very overt when you really look at them that basically get you to 100% believe that the wall is Chinese. Hmm. What is it? The old the pagoda and the shape of the, the slant and the... Yep. Yeah. 100% yeah. the pagodas. Yeah. They are not on the Great Wall, but Disney put them there to program children to automatically believe in that narrative that the Chinese built this construction. Now, what Disney also does is little truth drops. Do you see the truth drop in here? Yeah, yeah, with the, uh, the battlements on both sides. But again, they lowered a little bit so they look more yeah. like their, yeah, they did. their Armaco railing for cars. Yeah, of course. yeah they lowered a little bit, but there's, a, there's another truth there's a truth bomb right here in the middle of the picture. What am I looking at? This is a road for cars. <laughs> well, yeah, true. Like I said, it was so it, it, it's so obvious. You, it's easy to miss. So, so there's a there's a lot in this picture. Disney is conveying. It's conveying that you need to believe that this is Chinese construction, but it's also telling you the truth. It's not a wall. It's a road. Cars only travel on roads. It's a beautiful way they did that. So, I'm thinking, right now, I'm not sure we covered everything. Uh, so I want to look at this. I want to look at this because we need I, to make sure that everybody's got it. I lost all track of the list. Oh man, it's okay. Involved in the conversation. It's okay. Hey, oh, uh, I hope the audio is all good too, folks. We we, we hope the audio is good. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to amplify it. What you're looking at is a coin found in China from 330 B, uh, A.D. This is Constantine. Yeah. And it's not the only Roman artifact. As a matter of fact, I have a list here of things I want to I want, I want to read to you. These this is stunning. This is astonishing because it takes our theory here and gives it relative context. Listen, guys. In 166 AD under Marcus Aurelius, Romans traveled from the Persian Gulf to China, and this is in the historical record. So we can't say there's no Roman contact. Also, the establishment histories admit that first contact between China and the, and the Mediterranean cultures was in 200 BC. When was the official narrative for the building of the wall? Yeah, 200 BC. 200 BC, the Great Wall was being built. So, here's another fact. This is establishment history now. The Silk Road was opened for trade for everybody in 130 BC. This means that the Great Wall had been under construction for 90 years. Now, 90 years doesn't sound like a long time for a 5,000 mile long construction, but it wasn't all done immediately. And if you had 200 work crews, and there was thousands of men per crew and just one or two Roman engineers in each group and the rest of them Roman provincial slaves who were master masons as well as thousands of Chinese cool, modern, you know, ancient coolies who, would, who were helping, then 200 construction sites would have expanded that wall rapidly till the individual sites would have been connected. Mm, absolutely. You would have done them all compartmentally. 90 years is a long time. And if you've got 200 work crews and each one's got thousands of laborers, you're going to get a lot done. So, uh, I already told you about the, uh, the, the spice and silks and porcelains, jade, the tea and all that. Uh, another thing that we need to discuss is that the Romans were addicted at this time to opium. Uh, op uh, I did a, Martin and I did a search and we found out that opium was very popular in Rome. They used it for caesarean sections and the Romans used it to keep people chemically dependent. Mm. This is a very interesting clue because the past can be a predicate for the future for the collective. You already understand what the British did to the Chinese. People think it was the other way around, that the Chinese had the opium. No, the opium was imported from India. The British got it from India, took it to China, and got the Chinese addicted to it, enslaved them, and this is how, this is how Hong Kong and this is how the British maintained control through the East India Company. Mm -hmm. shipping, the shipping guilds controlled all of China. Just a, few, just a few people controlled the whole of China because of the opium trade. Pretty insidious history.
when you look at it. But yeah. history is a lie agreed upon, brother, as this is shown. And this really should be sending uh, tremors up the spines of the academics up there who've been pushing this line that this is a great wall of China was built for defensive purposes. Because like everything that Jason's been showing you here, I mean, it's it's obvious. And it, like I said, it's so obvious, it's a wonder no one ever really looked at it before. The Great Wall of China is kind of an out there sort of a thing that's over on the side that you don't really put yeah. that much focus on. But um, Well, I mean, now that you have, we never had any reason to question it. It's in China. Well, yeah, exactly. You know I mean? So, I mean, we just never had any reason to, to look at it. But uh, I want to I mention this. Uh, at Sichuan province in China, Roman artifacts have been excavated by archaeologists. That again puts Romans in China. Hmm. So uh, we've already gone through the distance between being a Roman distance and the width of the road, and we've bailed back. We've gone through all that. So uh, Roman civic projects were always built by prisoners, slaves, and conscripts. Oh, and in 1993, Chinese archaeologists found Roman architecture and, and Roman coins near Yongsheng in China. One of them was this, this uh, Constantine coin. Okay. So that was in 1993. In 2016, archaeologists excavated at a Roman Britain site Chinese skeletons. What are Chinese skeletons doing in Roman-occupied Britain? Hmm. It's almost as if a Roman, a Roman uh, slave owner probably had some coolies, you know what I mean? Probably yeah. had some Chinese, and he made it all the way. They probably died in Britain or whatever. They were buried there. Mm. And, I mean, that's just amazing. It, it, the reason I'm mentioning these things is because academia is against diff diffusionism. They don't like any evidence whatsoever of anything transcontinental in ancient times, any, any, anything going on. They're, they're anti-diffusionist. And this, this absolutely shows that, like, with that, that wharf at the end there in the LSC, I mean, this, this, you could have had trade going anywhere and, and trade coming from anywhere. They could have been going to the Americas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there could mean, be, the trades could have been going to Central America where Oaxia State is of the Olmecs and they all look Chinese. Yeah, it shows just how connected the ancient world was and just how much we've been lied to about everything, you know? 100%. The last artifact is 1922. Irish archaeologists were baffled when they found hundreds of Chinese seals. Seals were carried by Chinese merchants who stamped their merchandise and their letters. Hundreds of Chinese seals were found in, in, in Ireland in 1922. Don't know. It's, a, it's an anomaly. Don't even talk about it. It's crazy. So there's two things, there's two things too. We, we can, we, there's two elements here that need to be discussed. One of them is the fact that, like you said earlier, it's absolutely obvious that when it comes to expertise and engineering, who is it, China or Rome? Yeah, absolutely. It's Rome, 100%. So when it comes to trade expansion, who is it, yeah, right. Rome or China? It's Rome. The reason China is isolationist, always has been. 5,000 years of history, they do not like incursions. They do not like anybody coming into their civilization, doing anything. They do not accept. As a matter of fact, most people don't know this, but, but in American history, American warships in the 1880s had to go to Japan and China and threaten to cannon their cities if they didn't exchange and trade, trade, trade with us. This is what we did in the United States, and it's in the historical record. And uh, this is how we opened up, because they did not want to trade with the rest of the world. But America knew, the United States knew, that if the Chinese didn't engage and they, and they maintained that isolationism, European powers were already rising. And it would be no time before, before a European power just invaded China and just took it. So to keep that from happening, the United States went over there and made them engage in international trade. So... That's how isolationist they are. So yeah, uh, Matt, uh, uh, Max, I think we're, I think we're pretty good. I, I think this is the Amazon of the ancient world. Yeah, it is. I mean, when you really look at what they could have done, have you got any of those shots of, of where the, the wall branches off? Oh yes, yes. Is there's some of them. Yeah, there's. there's I wanted, I wanted to see a couple of those shots because, like, these are like exits off the highway, you know. Yeah. Well, you know what? The best way to do that is like this. Let me go ahead and add them. So these are, what you're talking about is 
They are they are literally like highways. Mm-hmm. There was even a video that showed a, where it branched out. Yeah. Oh like, look! Oh look at these pictures here, where even old pictures showed that it was understood. Look at these old pictures. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. They there's, even, there's areas where you get you've actually got to a tower, and right next to a tower, there's a there's a. I mean, if this was a defensive wall and it was just there as a, a wall to keep people out of the country, why have you got pieces branching off and going down and, and you know, to where there would have once been villages, even if there aren't villages there now? It's like exits off the main highway. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. once you, you look at this stuff, like I said before, you can't unsee it. Once you, once you really start looking at what the true function of this structure is and how it's a 5,000 mile long castle with, with it's a trade route it's 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 accommodation it's storehouses it's it's exits it's a it's a made highway going straight across even the official even the official narrative official narrative maps show the highway look, well, it, look is. How it branches off it's virtually like the largest highway ever built that's right you're exactly. going right across china and across into into europe it's absolutely incredible yeah, it goes to all the major 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 uh, urban centers they would have collected their merchandise and sent yeah. it up the road. Send and it bra- up the road. branching out and going down through the Caucasus and down through everywhere. That's it. So, I mean, it, it's absolutely mind-boggling what it actually was and what we've been told it was. And like I said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's, it's so obvious that that's what it is and that's what it was used for. And culminating in that dock at the end there is, uh, is incredible. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to... To, that's the end of the wall, and it's really a good way to end the video. It is. I mean, that's <laughs> that that in itself. That's a that shows a major shipping port that would have been going in both directions. And imagine what it would have been like to have a huge section of just wooden keys built out there. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's wooden docks. So we so it takes 18 months to walk the 5,000 miles of the Great Wall of China, but with 25,000 constructions, towers, that can all hold merchandise at any one time for over a thousand years, this thing was just moving merchandise. Merchandise every day was passing through each tower, going to a tower destination they locked down at night. Sun comes up, full mobility, everybody's moving again. Sun goes down, locked down. It doesn't matter that it takes 18 months to get the merchandise to the end because the merchandise never stops moving. So it's already sold by the time it arrives to, to Rome. And mm. people can purchase and buy in real time their, their Chinese porcelains and their, their ointments and oils and eucalyptuses. And they can get their spices. They can get uh, uh, bamboo. They can buy all the Chinese goods are steadily, steadily coming. Silks. Uh, Oh, I can't remember, little bonsai trees. Everything the Chinese wanted to sell is going up the road. But what's really interesting is the research unveiled. Chinese didn't want anything from Rome but gold. That's all they wanted. That's, that's again, that isolationist mentality. They don't want anything cultural from anybody else. They just want gold. Hmm. So, interesting yeah. stuff. So anyway, folks, thought you'd enjoy that conversation. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'll get back to you soon. I'll be back in Mexico probably next week. And uh, I'll get back to some more normal videos for you. But this is definitely something to think about. Please share with everybody that you know, because I think it's important. You know, it's important that we know where we came from and might give us some idea of where we're going. Thanks for listening. And thanks for the chat, Joe. Awesome, man. Awesome. And for the hospitality. Yeah, man. Very, very hospitable, man. It's been uh, it's been great staying here. And I'll, I'll have to do it again. Oh, I'm, I'm all for it. Mm-hmm.